Welcome to the Herman Bailey Zoom series. I have a world famous author today, a name that everyone will know. There he is right there on camera, Jerry Jenkins. What an honor, pleasure. This makes my year. Well, it's great to be with you, Herman. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, you're the guy I just have one of the books that I had in my library, Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins, the Left Behind series. How many millions sold? That, uh, that series is still clipping along 26 years after it released. And um, I think it's over 63 million now for the series. And it's still selling about 20,000 units a month. Um, even after all this time, it's just been astounding to, to me. So it's still under Tyndale. Yes. Wow. Wheaton, Illinois. Did, didn't you have some involvement with Moody Bible Institute? Yeah, I worked at Moody for over 30 years, and then I was on their board for about 18 years and uh, served as chairman of the board for seven. So yeah, very, very close ties to Moody. A number of my family graduated. I took some courses at Moody. I, as a teenager, went to the Moody Memorial Church in downtown mm -hmm. Chicago. I sat up in the balcony. Red Path, remember him? Culberson, all of, all of those names? Yeah, Culbertson was president of Moody when I was a student there. Uh, Red Path was a little before my time, but I remember, uh, remember Culbertson for sure, and of course, Dr. Sweeting. Yes, yes. So, so you, you've grown up in quite an environment and you've written, what, 198 books? Right. Uh, my, my kids tell me I've written more books than I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how does the connection with Tim LaHaye and you begin, I think you said in the 90s, in the 1990s? Yeah, in the early 90s, my agent called me and said that I uh, want to know if I'd ever met Tim LaHaye. And I said I had not, although I was very familiar with him. He was a you know really popular uh, speaker and writer. And, and my agent said, um, you know, he's got a great fiction idea and you're a novelist with no ideas. So let's get you guys <laughs> together. And, and uh, we hit it off immediately. I mean, Tim, Tim was the age of my parents. And uh, so there was a father-son dynamic there. And I respected him, admired him, and I happened to agree with his view of eschatology, the end times, even though I'm not a scholar or a theologian. But uh, he had this idea, and he didn't want to try to write the book. That was uh, important to me because I think it's hard to co-write fiction. Yeah. Um, but he was the he was the uh, authority on the on the scripture and on the theology and all that stuff. So he kept me on track that way. And he was a great cheerleader too. I would send him 100 or 200 pages at a time, and he would tell me send me more. I want to find out what happens next myself. So it was a great relationship for many years. Whose idea was it to make it the series that it became? Did it start with one book and you go, hey, we could have a book number two and three? Well, it really began, it was going to be one big book and cover the, the uh, rapture, the seven years of tribulation and the glorious appearing. I got about halfway through the writing of that first manuscript and I had only covered two weeks of the seven years. So <laughs> I called Tyndale and I called Tim and I said, uh, we're going to need more, more books here. And they said, well, let's make it a trilogy. Well, by the time I got to the end of book three, I was still only a few months in because I wanted to have character development make it realistic, have people really be able to identify with the characters. And they said, just tell the story at whatever pace you need to, because it's going well, and we're going to just keep doing it till it's done. So it, it eventually became 16 books. Unbelievable. Now, I've heard, because you would be the individual I'd like to ask, do, do you automatic write when you're writing? I mean, you're coming up with names and, and, and it's got to follow. How, how do you possibly keep what I just wrote here? to chapter 24 or whatever that may be do, does it just come out of your fingers automatically like a person writing a note you know it kind of does um, I, I teach writing online i've got about 2,000 students i teach and I, t I tell them that novelists are broken into two categories there's what we call outliners people who really outline everything before they start they do they do fictitious interviews with their characters get to know them that type of thing 
The other half of novelists are what we call pantsers. We write by the seat of our pants. <laughs> uh, Stephen King is one of those kind of writers. And okay. he says, just put interesting characters in difficult situations and write to find out what happens. And so that's sort of my style. But I do have to kind of take notes as I go, because as you say, I might forget what I said in, in chapter 24 or where this character is. <laughs> so I'm kind of a hybrid between the outliner and the pantser. And then we move to Chosen. Because this, I, I mean, reading this, it really looks like a kind of a similar that it could have a number of this, because I see this as number one. So it could be number 10 later on. Is, is that? Well, it looks like they're going to, yeah, it looks like they're going to do seven seasons. And, and I'm going to okay. write a novel for each each season. So this is the first one. And, and hopefully there'll be seven. It, it, you know, it, it is it is so unique because the Bible talks about we are chosen, and that, and that's why it is it is so appropriate, especially for this time and age we're living in. And this again is revealing who Jesus was, what it was like to be with him, what his personality what his characteristics were, even though the Bible says that, but this breaks it down into a livable novel where you could almost feel like you're there. How, how, did, yeah, you, the, how, how did you come up with that? Well, you know, obviously it's based on the, the TV series that my son created and he and his writing team wrote brilliant scripts for these, uh, for these shows. And his idea was, you know, so many of the Jesus films and movies we see, um, you know, they, they show the, the deity side of Jesus and, they, and he's impossible to identify with because he's perfect. He said, let's show him as fully God and fully man and show the people that he chose to, to surround himself with, because those are the ones we can identify with. I can identify with Nicodemus and Mary Magdalene and Simon and Matthew. And, you know, they were flawed people, they were needy people. And, uh, you know, this is a way to, to make them accessible and not just saints on pedestals or statues or paintings, really see their personalities and say, hey, that's me too. This is the, th the same skepticism I would have had. This is the same fear and reluctance I would have had. This is the, these are the same flaws that I do have. And so that was the key. And, that, and I think Dallas, my son, did a great job of making those characters accessible, which made my job easier as a novelist, too. So, so his movie is your son's creation? Right. So he, he has your D DNA then. He scripts and writes and puts it together. Yeah, I'd like to think, uh, you know, it used to be that he was known as my son, and I'm now becoming known as, as his father. <laughs> this thing has exploded. The, the series has been seen already. The first season is out, and they just finished shooting season two. The, the first season has been seen by over 90 million people in every country of the world in 80 languages. It's just exploded. And, Jerry, uh, are you serious? I feel like I just, oh, it's just unbelievable. And I, I feel like I have my nose pressed up to, to his window saying, Dallas, can I play too? <laughs> <laughs> did, did you have any clue that this was an offshoot of you well you know i've been obviously following his career uh he's he's been in the movie making business for a few decades and and early on i helped finance his movies and we had a little production company and that type of thing but this was his own idea and and uh, he ran off with it and, and did it and it really was the um was born of failure. One of his feature films called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone, I thought was going to be a fantastic movie and it tested well and everybody in the studio thought it was great. And it just bombed at the box office. I mean, just hardly anybody saw it. Just wow. crickets were in the, in the theater. And um, he was devastated, but he thought, well, maybe this is the time to do what I've wanted to do and do something that's really based on Jesus in the first century. And and, uh, and he had a, a short that he had done for his church. He put that online and, and they looked for crowdfunding, not gifts or donations, but what investors. Is that, what, is that, what is that like, crowdfunding? You, he, he put the pilot, this, this uh, short that he had done for his church uh, about a shepherd who went to the nativity scene. And um, he said, if you, if you want to see more of this, if you'd like to see me make a, a TV series out of this about the people Jesus chose to surround himself with, um, you 
you can get involved, you can invest. And I think the minimum investment was like $100. Within a few months, it became the largest crowdfunded media event in history, Christian or secular. Um, it's now a couple of years since they did that, but they've raised over $20 million already. And it takes about $10 million a season to shoot this. And um, it, it just became a phenomenon. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. If people haven't seen it, it's so easy. You just download the, the app, the chosen.tv, and you can see it free on your phone and, and shoot it to your television if you have a smart TV. And uh, they're offering it free to people around the world. And the way they finance it is through this crowdfunding and then people, you know, paying it forward so other people around the world can see it. That is now. Now, tell me the relation film book. Well, again, as I say, I, you know, I, I was uh, watching this with great interest and I spent a little time on the set and I was just thrilled with what Dallas had done and how successful it was being. And I said, you know, can you use a, a novelization of each season? Would that be fun? And of course, um, being known as his father and, and having written a few books myself, he, he liked that idea. And uh, so that's how it came about and focus on the family and Broad Street Publishing uh, got involved. And uh, so the book has just come out in the last uh, week or so. And uh, it had a lot of pre-sales and, and uh, the fans of The Chosen are really, really uh, grabbing it up. So this is, this is going to be a bestseller. Well, they, they pre-sold over 100,000 copies. So that's a pretty good start. Yeah. So you, you've had 21, is it right? 21 bestseller, New York Times bestsellers? Right. Correct. I mean, that's a record, isn't it? It's not a record. I mean, there are people that have, have, have done that and, and more, but it's, uh, it's probably a record for Christian publishing. That's what sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Um, and most of, most of those obviously are, are uh, left behind titles, but uh, I assisted Billy Graham with his memoirs. That was a bestseller and several, I've done several athletes and, uh, and uh, other evangelists that, that uh, had pretty good sales. The, 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 uh, you, you look at this, you say through the eyes of people like us, when, when you read Chosen, uh, in Amazing Jesus associated with individuals that we probably would not hang with yeah that's right it's kind of amazing today you know if, if people find out you have friends who are unbelievers or yeah. are you know not not wonderful examples of good citizens yeah, sure. uh, they want to criticize that and they'll and sometimes even brag about all my friends are christians well right. how does that spread the message how, how do we get to these people then and um, so, yeah, Jesus would, would go to the down and outers and uh, he was criticized for eating with tax collectors and going to their homes and that type of thing. But um, we're still reading about him 2000 years later. So I think he was doing the right thing. That, that, that always amazes me how Matthew, a tax collector, and all of a sudden, not only is he in his home, but he has all the other tax collectors and people are going, right. what is it with this Jesus guy? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's so remarkable, but yet that's why we identify with chosen. Yeah. Those are the people we can identify with. I, I identify with Matthew and he, you know, he, and, and with Nicodemus and Simon and Mary, those are the, the four that are really featured in the first season. And uh, they all had their various uh, foibles and flaws and doubts and fears, just like we all do. And, um, uh, Fortunately, this TV series and, and thus the novel shows Jesus as a real person with with a sense of humor and he teases his friends and they enjoy interacting with him and you know, they, they show the, the miracles too and the, the, the impact he has on people. So I just hope people uh, really enjoy it and, and learn from it. Do, do you write especially this kind of material? with fear and trembling, because we're not supposed to add to or take from. How do you right. interpret that? Yeah, I interpret that to mean we're not to add to or take away from the gospel itself. In other words, the fact that Jesus lived, that he died for our sins on the cross, that he was buried, rose again the third day, and, and is an advocate for us to God in heaven. That's the gospel. And we would never do anything that would, that would violate the truth of that. We do speculate on, you know, when there's the feeding of the 5,000 or there's um, the miracle of the, the fish that, that Peter caught, 
we, we speculate on say, here's what might've happened before that. Here's what might've been some conversations or some people involved in, in why this was so important. And I think readers give us that, that uh, license because they know that we would never violate what's actually in the scripture. When we get to the point of what, when the miracles happen or when there's uh, things that have been rehearsed in scripture, like the Nicodemus meeting Jesus by night, uh, that's almost word for word the way it is from the Bible, because you know we certainly don't want to speculate on uh, you know adding anything to that. But we do say this is what that might have looked like, and uh, and readers know if people know the Bible, they say um, you know this part from the Bible and this part they're they're speculating, but it's interesting and it adds some texture to it. But our whole goal is to get people back to their Bibles and back to church and back to their relationship with Christ. You know, I've often thought when, when Jesus was trained as a carpenter's son, did his family and those around him really believe he was the Messiah? Because it was almost like, in case that don't work out for you, you can be a carpenter. Yeah. Yeah. And I think scripture indicates that, that uh, it, it was a long time before his siblings did believe. His uh, own brother. Clearly Mary. A, yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, Clearly, Mary and Joseph knew because they were told before he was born. But um, yeah, apparently, it took a long time for him to con convince even his uh, siblings. Yeah, isn't it amazing today, Jerry? When, when you have a real popular man of God, and people will say, "You know, when you're standing near him, you can just sense the power of God." And and my mind always goes back to the family members around the Messiah, Jesus, and some of them did not accept the fact, well, okay, he's my brother, but what are you saying he is? It was almost, was there a, an aura given off of him or no, he was just God, man. Yeah, it seems like there would be an aura, doesn't it? But um, yes, I found, you know, when you study the Old Testament and you see the children of Israel, I mean, God's given him a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, and he's feeding him with manna and he's bringing water from a rock. And the next day they're building a golden calf to, to worship because they're, exactly. you know, they're, they're spraying already. So it's, it's amazing. We're, we, we really can be spiritually blind. It's, it's human, again, you know, going back to the word chosen. When, I, I mean, it's funny you should bring up the illustration of we need individuals or friends that maybe are not Christians that experience our life and kind of we chat with them all the time. I have that kind of friend for 30 years. He's a shock jock. He's in New York now. And he started watching our program. We've done this for 40 years. And we became friends. And of course, I would share Christ with him. And he'd go, you know, things like, you know, Herman, I've I pay my bills. I'm good to people. I, I give to charities. I do all of this stuff, you know? And so what, so if I die, what is going to happen to me? I say, I would say, if you don't accept Christ as your personal Lord and savior, you're going to go straight to hell. He would say, don't say that. But somebody in church recognized, because I was doing my program, they turned around one day in the pew in front of me and they said, are you really friends with that guy? And of course, he knew who it was because he had a local program here and one in New York. And I said, yes. And he goes, that just, that don't make sense. And I said, don't you have any unsaved friends? And he turned back around. <laughs> Conversation ended. But it's interesting how we get into that, that kind of way of life where we think all of my circle must be Christian. Yeah, there's a great comfort in going to church and being with people that agree with us and are believers and all that. But it um, seems to me if we're reading the New Testament, we need to realize if all of our friends are believers and none of them are unbelievers, we're the Pharisees. We're the ones saying, well, I can't associate with you because you're beneath me and you're a sinner and you're, you don't believe in Jesus. Well, how are they ever going to if we don't associate with them and tell them the good news? When, when the term chosen because unless the holy spirit draws us that's chosen yeah. we can't even become a believer 
And that's why sometimes, you know, we as human beings get the idea that we have something to do with it. We share Christ and we got to close the deal. Yeah. But that's why books like yeah. yours, yours will, will illuminate. That could be me that he's talking about in that, in that particular chapter, because you, you make yeah. it, you make it today. Yeah, I hope that's true. And I want that's what we want people to see and, and to recognize. Um, Dallas said that the, the reason he liked the, the title The Chosen for his TV series was that he said Jesus chose people to surround himself with and he made them something they were not. And he said, if people can catch that, if they can realize I can be something with Jesus that I'm not otherwise, that's the gospel, that's salvation, that's redemption, that's forgiveness. And uh, if people can identify with those characters, that's our hope. Do you feel chosen as a writer that God gave you a gift that he put in you, in your mind, in your, in your drive, because you have to have all of that or you can't finish a novel? You know, it's interesting. I was a teenager uh, when I started writing. I was a sports writer for a, for a local paper before I was old enough to even drive. My mother had to drive me to the to the ball games to cover. And but at about sixteen, I was at camp and I heard a message where they were, you know, saying that some people are called to full time Christian work. And I definitely felt that call. Wow. And I went forward and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to give up the sports writing and I'm going to have to study to become a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary. And the, the wife of the speaker counseled me, and I told her that, and she said, don't give up the writing too soon. She said, sometimes God equips us before he calls us. Good. And she said, you know, you may use writing as the vehicle to, to fulfill your call. So my call is not to writing. My call is to full-time Christian service, and writing happens to be the gift that God equipped me with to fulfill that call. So that's how I view it. That is a that is a great explanation. It really is. Are you introvert, extrovert? Well, believe it or not, I am an introvert. And, uh, you know, I have to do a lot of public speaking and a lot of media like this and, and everything. And I like people. I like to go, you know, we're going to a small group tonight and I enjoy interacting with people. But I test as an introvert. I'm, I'm much happier, you know, alone in front of the computer screen and making up stories. Uh, so I, I guess a little of both. But, yeah, I, I am introverted. Most writers are. When, when you when you build the character, do you feel what you're writing? I really do. In fact, uh, that's one of the things I try to teach writers, too, is that the fun of being a novelist is that you, ha you have to be the character. Now, that gets pretty intimidating when you're writing about deity. If I'm writing about Jesus, uh, I, I don't think I've ever felt like Jesus um, being, you know, 100 percent God and 100 percent man. Um, but I do, especially the other characters. Um, my, my late mother said, uh, I asked her if she sees me in, in, uh, in my novels. And she says, I see you in every character. Wow. Which is an interesting insight because I sometimes write about little kids. I sometimes write about old women. I sometimes write about Pharisees. Um, and yeah, there's a little of me in every character. And, and while I'm writing that scene, I'm trying to be that person and say, what would I think? What would I say? How would I react to this? What would I do? Um, so it, it, you know, you get to, to really have a lot of fun in your mind as a writer. When, when you move to the next issue, what will that carry with it from this? Well, the, the next, uh, season, uh, covers the, the first four people that were, were also covered in season one, uh, but adds more to, there are people being added to the, to, to the disciples, obviously. Um, one of one of the fun characters that I'm going to enjoy writing is uh, Thomas. Uh, Dallas has invented Thomas being um, the supplier of wine to the wedding at Cana. So in the first book, that's where we meet him. He he and his uh, uh, vintner come and and provide that wine, and then they run out of wine. And of course, Jesus performs the miracle. That's some of the speculation where we don't know that Thomas was had anything to do with that at all. Um, or that, um, you know, he, he was even around at that time. But we do know he joined the disciples later. And so 
um, we paint him in this first book uh, as a skeptic, a doubter. Uh, and so that fits his personality, but he'll be played out much more um, thoroughly in the next episodes where he actually joins the disciples and travels with Jesus. So, and there'll be other characters like that. So I'm really looking forward to, to writing so, season two so, as well. So your son, your son's name is Dallas, is it? Correct. Yeah. Is he now scripting the next, the next, the next? Yes, he has two writing partners and uh, they've just finished shooting season two and they've already written uh, a lot of, of the next few seasons because they're, they're really trying to, to do this as a, a whole single unit, even though it's broken into these seven seasons. It gives them a chance to really investigate these characters and let them grow and develop. My goodness. Now, you, how, many, how many boys do you have? I have three grown sons. Dallas is our eldest. And what are their ages? Dallas is 45. I have a middle son who's 43 and a younger son who's 38. My goodness. Could you just for a moment, kind of in case somebody watching, they don't know Christ, kind of back to unsaved friends, watch this telecast, open the door for them, not only to have this book, because it is phenomenal, but a relationship with Christ. We got about a minute. Yeah, I just like to say that um, so often when I share my faith, somebody, the first reaction somebody gets is they say, well, I'm not religious, or I don't like religion. I don't like organized religion. And I always like to say, I don't either. And Jesus didn't either. Right. Religion is man's effort to get to God. And I say, Jesus is God's way to get to man. He sent Jesus to live a perfect life and then to take our sins on, on himself when he died on the cross for our sins. Then he raised him from the dead and he's in heaven now pleading for us, for our souls and for our lives. And the Bible says all you need to do is to believe that and receive Jesus as your savior and you'll be assured of heaven. You'll be protected for you won't go to hell and your life will be changed. It doesn't mean your life will be get easier. It might get harder. You might face persecution. You might face ridicule from your friends. But what's more important than your eternal soul? Amen. I just pray that you'll look into this and receive Christ. Get your copy. You will absolutely keep turning the pages and keep reading. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Bye-bye.